You used to write for the Catholic Herald in England. Yeah. In kind of English Catholic circles, is Polish Catholicism quite idealized? I've read uh, uh, very much so, yeah. the author Rod Dreyer, who was a Catholic, and I've read him talking about Polish Catholicism when he grew up. It was kind of this amazing thing where people imagine this very kind of pure Catholic culture. Is, is that the reputation Poland could have in British? Um, yeah, I mean, our office had a lot of Catholic connections. People, I mean, Polish connections, sorry, obviously had Catholic connections. Um, people who was, uh, either married to Poles or, or had Polish ancestry. Um, I mean, we were growing up in the you know, era of, sort of John Paul II, so it was very much seen as, if not the most Catholic country in Europe, then um, certainly the kind of, I suppose, like the moral exemplar of Catholicism, because it was not just a Catholic country, but it was, it was a Catholic country that actually used its religion to basically bring down communism, not just in Poland, but... Mm. Uh, setting off a kind of chain reaction, which brought it down everywhere, and, and it's you know it was very impressive that. Um, and then this comes back to this kind of you know romantic idea of the poles. I'm not sure if, sure if the poles are like it themselves, but you know having you know be, faced one tyranny, they then sort of overcome a, another one, um, and without ever embracing it in the way uh, certain you know other countries where a lot of people actually believed in communism. Um, uh, and the faith was like you know hugely important. One must feel like a bit of a sense of sadness if that's going to go. Which you know the kind of like the irony is like communism can't crush Christianity, but you know the kind of the market can because mm. you kind of it becomes ir it becomes irrelevant or or it becomes mocked or it becomes sort of laughed off or because people are wealthy enough that they don't really need they don't feel they need the the, the sort of support the, that religion brings. Whatever we have an opponent, it kind of strengthens us, as long as we have yeah. the ability to fight back against it, because it's always testing us, and we're always growing stronger and more skillful as we oppose it. But if we find ourselves free of obvious opponents, it's it's, it's easier to get complacent. Yes, I mean, and that's the worst. I mean, that's the worst thing um, for any religion. I think it's probably just to become irrelevant. Mm. Which um, I mean, is after communism, Pol you know, Poland had ma massive church attendance and you know, people, was, there were processions in the streets and people still having first holy communions, but in, in the West, we're 40 years after the church can do whatever it's like, or even countries where the church is subsidized, it's, you know, the church, they're all empty. Hmm. Um, because, you know, the, the I don't know, the market just has, um, just has kind of such, such attraction, it, it can offer so much in the form of entertainment or, or, or sort of lifestyle choices that, you know, that weren't available to almost anyone, you know, two or three generations ago. And just the expanded choice. I mean, we were talking right. about how um, after the pandemic, lots of people never went back to church because once you break that kind of longstanding right. habit, it's like, how can you really resurrect it? You've got comfortable with sleeping in and, you know. Right. I mean, a lot, lots of things are basically habit in life and uh, people do them because uh, they've always done them. Um, which is kind of, you know the norm in most human societies. This is the way it's always been, and then once you stop that, it's very hard to go back to it. There's been talk in Polish politics for many years about this this kind of term, the imitation model. Like, to what extent should uh, the Central and Eastern European countries, which developed out of communism, should imitate the model of Western European countries? And obviously, you know, in some senses, in some economic senses, some uh, sense of political institutions, it can be a good thing, but it can right. also be a bad thing. I mean, where, where would be some areas where the imitation model would fall short and maybe uh, Central and Eastern Europeans should be looking across to the West and saying, maybe we actually we should do the opposite of that or we should do something quite different to that. Right. So, I mean, you, you know, you see your friends going down the path or sort of, you know, down the rapids and you can see them getting into trouble. Uh, and the obvious thing is, you know, you go on a different course, you know, think I'm going to go and do that exact same thing. Uh, I mean, the obvious example is multiculturalism because, uh, you know, we have arguments about the, the gender thing, which is kind of coming to Poland from where here. Um, lots of more teenagers are, are sort of um, embracing the idea of changing sex or whatever it is. But that, I mean, sadly, for a lot of the actual children affected, it's, it's not reversible. But as a social force, that is, is, it's actually losing now in the West. In England, actually, there's a huge reaction to it. And that can be basically turned back and all the people who support it would just pretend they never did. It would be like a lot of things. But multiculturalism is the main one because... Once you have, um, once you start the process of immigration and of multiculturalism, it's basically unstoppable. Uh, it it creates the conditions for more immigration. And I mean, I find it very strange uh, if if you're sort of um, like a voter in Poland or maybe some of the other countries 
um, that were behind the oldies and block. If you look at what happens, you know, look at Paris or London or some of the other cities in, in the West, um, in Amsterdam, in Germany, uh, the the effects of uh, immigration at our levels have been ne- very uh, overall quite negative. Um, you know, I'm a believer in, in kind of moderation and all things. A certain amount of multiculturalism is is very healthy and it's a sign of a healthy economy and a, and a kind of open society. Um, and the, the kind of best countries tend to attract people from around the world. But once it gets to a certain stage, there is no sort of stability in the system. Once you have um, the settlement of communities... Um, with their own political leaders, with kind of campaigning charities speaking on their behalf, um, with their own kind of narrative. Once they start, they then intend to grow with the support of, usually with the support of the major left-wing party. And it's an unsubtle process. I mean, once it happens, there is no going back. And, and what's happened to Britain and France is a kind of a warning, I think, to um, to voters in Poland, you really don't want to go down this path. Um, the, the problems we're having now in England are, are quite serious, and they're basically they're, it's irreversible, and and it's a kind of um, it's a huge it's a huge block in the kind of political system and in kind of everyday life. You know, the moment, for example, we, we've had major kind of protests and and problems recently between. Um, the black community and an Indian shopkeeper in South London, which got very nasty. We've had kind of fight the the starts of protests and fights in Leicester between Indians and Pakistanis. And during last year, while the Queen was dying, there were basically there were fights going on in Leicester, massive mm. fights, the police involved. Um, there's always got um, the case of all of Brit- all of London's armed police have um, handed in their guns and they refused to do their jobs anymore because there was a shooting of a of a black guy. And the policeman has been arrested, and, and and it's going to be another one of these kind of American-style cases where it's going to be very difficult. These are all kind of sort of everyday problems which Poland can avoid. Mm. It can, it can, you know, it can be welcoming to people. I mean, you know, you are I'm speaking to someone who's literally immigrant here. Um, it can be welcoming to people. It can be liberal in the kind of truer sense of the words, and it can be open. But you really don't want to go down this path that the West has gone because there's no turning back. And where's the distinction between, you know, being liberal to having, you know, some people who are going to come in, they're going to, you know, enrich the economy, they're going to add innovation, they're going to add, you know, different cultural elements and multiculturalism. Because to me, multiculturalism suggests that you're introducing new cultures which are kind of significant enough to, uh, you know, be uh, kind of blocks, almost cultural blocks uh, within one nation. Yeah, and and voting blocks as well. Mm. And and once that happens, there's... um, Really, no turning back. I mean, in Britain recently, we've had, you know, so we had the, the 75th anniversary of the Windrush uh, arrival, which was, I mean, the funny thing, of the, the Windrush was a ship that sailed from Jamaica to London in 1948, and it's become this iconic moment. Um, there were 300 Jamaican men, and they became the first of this kind of post-war migration. I mean, ironically, it was actually Polish migrants on the ship. Mm. There was members, there were Polish people who had fled from Poland and had been all around the world. Some many had gone to Russia, um, Iran, all these places, and, and were basically being brought back to London to live in England after. So it's a Polish ship. They just happened to have some spare places, and they said, oh, we'll sell them to the locals at half the price. And it became this iconic moment. But in the British um, the British political system, in the education system, um, at, in all the institutions, which are all basically run by progressives, so, I mean, that multiculturalism is a great thing. And this whole th- the story has been rewritten as if this was basically... This was the start of Britain. You know, the, the coins said diversity built Britain. And this is like our national narrative has basically been taken away from us. Mm. And it's, you know, I just really feel on a, on a kind of visceral level, this is so insulting to the people who are there. We're literally, the Industrial Revolution started in Britain. Like, sorry, it's, it's just a bizarre idea. And the problem is you've got competing narrative, ancestral narratives. You know, we have now have several national communities or ethnic groups which are over half a million or more than a million which are basically kind of blocks i mean it's more complicated than that because people will you know obviously as individuals some lots of people are more integrated than others and some and a lot of immigrants and second generation immigrants will will side with with the kind of the the majority because they Mm. feel like a sense of attachment to it um i mean even if you you know it's a famous meme if you go around any kind of right-wing anti-immigration movement in Britain, the, like half of them would be, you know, the children of immigrants. Mm. Um, but it, it becomes, 
on a kind of everyday level, it just makes your life feel like a bit crummier and a bit worse. I mean, even in the schools, you know, the children, the, the schools my children go to, like everything in that they learn in October is for black history. You know, they, they had to celebrate the wind rush um, as this kind of moment which kind of saved the country. I just think like, first, it's not true. Secondly, it's kind of just insulting. Uh, and these are all problems that could be easily avoided. But on a kind of more, you know, more everyday level, because multiculturalism, because most people, I mean, most of the studies of, um, in both in Britain and uh, in America, I think there's also studies in Sweden, most um, Europeans, people of European descent, whatever, will tend to move from an area when it, when it becomes multicultural, when it gets to a certain point. And it's not, not a very high point. And this is exactly the same for liberals and conservatives. I don't think that's a bad thing. It's just people... People feel uncomfortable when lots of the kids in their schools don't speak the same language or or people don't look like them or whatever the reason is. But what it means is the more multicultural you, ha you become, then the fewer people are able to afford a lifestyle which is pleasant to them, like live in an area they want to live in. And they spend more and more money going further away from where they want to be just to, just to have a kind of basic level of kind of happiness. Um, so it's not it's not like... It's not gonna. It does not like civil war. It's not like insurgency, but it just makes your life slightly worse. And it and these are all things that you know the poles could avoid because they're you know they're further upstream. They they've seen what's happened in in Paris and London, um, uh, and it would be very unwise for them to follow us.